Tom had a great chart, and James, it kind of shows, you know, the anxiousness that the Chinese have to deal domestically, whilst at the same time not losing face with with the U.S. Does it just get worse from here? The trade concerns. <sighs> It's difficult to see. I mean, it's, normally we talk about face-saving ways out, um, and I think it's interesting to note that maybe President Trump and President Xi are two of the few leaders in the world that don't necessarily feel they need to save face on the way out, certainly because this, the political situation in China is obviously vastly different, not being democratic, and President Trump has shown that he's just quite happy to, you know, completely sh uh, flip, flip his, uh, his views 180 degrees without much cause to do so. Mm. That being said, it does seem to me that the path now is for these tensions to remain elevated. What that means for the domestic situation in China is interesting to note, but yeah. I would say that where previously I would have said keeping the population happy is the number one priority of the Chinese policymakers. Mm -hmm. I think what we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months is that President Xi has shifted dramatically to the left towards a more Maoist approach to managing the Chinese economy, and he's consolidated power to such an extent that maybe that isn't quite the okay. limit on policy that it would have been previously. Okay, uh, that's a really interesting point. The other interesting point that we've been talking about more and more is possible dollar intervention from Treasury. I mean, what would that what would that actually mean for the currency market? Well, of course, we're, we're talking about it, but the question is, would it be effective if it were to come to pass? Because, of course, when we have seen episodes of intervention in previous times, those have been generally coordinated actions. So I think in the context of the U.S., I, I think the market uh, is fairly uh, of the view that if the U.S. were to, uh, to try and uh, cap the value of the greenback by unilateral intervention, it would probably be rather a, a rather short-term impact and probably wouldn't uh, have a material influence. So in a sense, what we've seen, of course, is that Mr. Trump continues to rail against the, the greenback via Twitter uh, and continues to put pressure on the Fed. But I think it may well be the case that if he can try and uh, restart the debate about uh, uh, additional stimulus from the Fed, particularly by an expansion of its balance sheet once again, that might be a more effective way of trying to stem the valuation of the greenback <coughs> rather than necessarily stoking the fires of uh, discussion of uh, unilateral intervention. James, I want to go on macro with you right now. It's a Friday. I've got a reset over the weekend after the quiet week we've had. Are you giving up on international and do you have to go more developed nation, big cap domestic? That's a good question, Tom. I, I, I don't think that you could quite be so broad brush, but I mean, obviously, the, the world that we're living in at the moment is one where currency concerns are, are huge. So as a you know, something which I find has been lost in the whole macro discussion and debate recently is, that, is the very notion of the risk-free rate in a domestic market. You know, the, the only return that one can earn in, in terms of your you know, domestic currency is the risk-free rate. Anything else that you earn above that, you are taking a risk. And so when we compare U.S. Treasury yields with um, bond yields in, in nominal <clears throat> terms, we're yeah. not really comparing like for like. So you have to be careful about looking at returns overseas and thinking that they're available to you as a domestic <clears throat> investor. So in a world where <laughs> currency volatility is likely to be high and where central banks are racing to the bottom, I think it pays for investors to be looking first and foremost in their domestic market before yeah. they look overseas. No, well said. I, I, I find this fascinating right now. The whole game on international investment is you get a couple years to catch up. With the turmoil we have with the trade war, with the interest rate cuts we've had in the last 48 hours, do we give up on the big jump in international at some point? Do you just toss away that traditional idea? I don't think you should toss it away. I mean, again, I think we have a tendency to sort of over-extrapolate uh, uh, short-term trends. I think there are, as always, there are big-picture structural things going on in the global economy, and there are cyclical things which go on around those structural things. I think it's fair to say that there is a popular narrative around globalization and whether or not that has reached a peak and what that means for the global economy and global financial markets going forward. And I think absolutely that is the right conversation to be having. But as always, you would need to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because in developed market space, we know that we have demographic headwinds to, to sort of structural growth problems, structural investment problems, which means that as a UK investor, or as a German investor, or as a US investor, I don't think you should look at a country like uh, India, for example, and say, hey, we don't want to be investing over there because globalization has reached a peak. The Indian population is huge and it's likely to be growing um, still fairly rapidly going forward. And the opportunity for growth just from that fact, let alone the policy choices that are being made there, I think is absolutely huge. And that's something you want to be exposed to.